Well, it's my great pleasure to welcome Josh Howie of UC Davis to talk to us today about alternating genera of torus knots. Great, thank you. And thanks, uh, Duncan, for the invite. Um, it's a shame I can't actually be in Montreal. That is one place I'd really like to uh, go someday. But um, anyway, for the meantime, we, we have to make do with this. Um, so today I'm going to talk about uh, the alternating genus of a knot and in particular uh, to apply this, um, well, to try and calculate this invariant for some uh, torus knots. And so the, um, one of the basic uh, types of knots that show up are alternating knots. These are the ones where you follow uh, some strand of the diagram along and it goes over, under, over, under, over, under, uh, so on. Um, there's, these are like really nice. Uh, we know a lot about them, uh, but one of the problems with studying knots is not all knots are alternating. So here's a little, uh, just a little local picture of part of a knot diagram, and you'll see that it's not alternating. Um, so people have tried many different uh, generalizations of alternating to uh, try and extend the nice properties to wider uh, classes of knots. Um, and so one particular thing we can do, um, one particular attempt is uh, something that Colin Adams did. And so what we do here is we see this, uh, there's this crossing in the center and it, um, it's the one that's uh, kind of messing up the alternating property. So what we do is we add a handle to our projection surface. So this blue uh, tube, which is running from a white region to a white region, uh, just kind of sticking up in the middle there, we attach that to our projection surface. So instead of say being on the sphere, we're now on a torus. And we can just isotope a little neighborhood of that uh, crossing that didn't really work. We can uh, do something just locally and we can put it on the surface and now we've made uh, this diagram alternating. So um, the isotopy looks, it might look a little bit strange, but if you go back in the opposite direction, uh, you can do some simple Reitermeister moves and you'll see that this is um, indeed the same uh, knot. Okay. And so the point, uh, the point is that every knot um, has an alternating diagram on some surface. Um, and so what happens is we just, wherever it, uh, the alternating property is going wrong, we can just add, add at the cost of adding a handle to our surface, uh, increasing the genus, we can make uh, this knot alternating on uh, some surface. Okay, and um, there's many, um, there's many sort of like different definitions you can make of what it means to be alternating on a surface. One particular one is uh, the following. We say that a knot is uh, if alternating, if it has some alternating diagram on a Heegaard surface, if. So being a Heegaard surface means that this uh, surface F bounds uh, handle bodies on both sides. And uh, the diagram is alternating on that surface. And um, the other um, condition we have is that all the complementary regions of the diagram are disks. Okay, so that's maybe uh, not necessarily gonna happen. And if we repetitively do this uh, Adams trick, um, we, might, um, we might mess that property up. But uh, nevertheless, every knot does indeed have one of these uh, F alternating projections for uh, some Heegaard surface uh, F. So uh, the definition we can then make for a knot is uh, there's something called the alternating genus. Uh, we write G sub alt of K, and it's the minimum to such genus of these uh, projection surfaces, such that the knot um, admits some F alternating diagram uh, on that surface F. Uh, so just like um, any knot invariant that's defined as the minimum of something, this is going to be uh, difficult to calculate. Um, but um, there's some very basic properties we get. Uh, the alternating genus is zero if and only if the uh, knot is alternating 
uh, in the classical sense, so meaning alternating onto the two sphere. And otherwise, this alternating genus is going to be at least one. Um, another, um, the f so these were introduced, um, I guess, by Colin Adams. And um, he proved the following uh, theorem. So originally it was proved for almost alternating knots with a, a, a large group of co-authors. And then when he studied uh, toroidally alternating knots, which are knots where the um, alternating genus is at most one. Um, so he was able to show that if you start with a prime uh, knot of alternating genus at most one, then that knot is either a torus knot uh, or a hyperbolic knot. So in uh, Thurston's, uh, I guess, geometric classification of uh, knots, there's uh, three things that can happen. You can be a torus knot or a hyperbolic knot or a satellite knot. So we get the following uh, corollary. Um, if we have a prime satellite knot, then its alternating genus um, is at least two. And there do indeed exist uh, knots where this alternating genus is um, exactly two for the uh, satellite knots. Um, furthermore, there's also uh, hyperbolic knots where the alternating genus is at least two. Um, but I don't think there's any, uh, um, there's actually there's some where it's known to be exactly two and um, that higher, higher alternating genera are not uh, known exactly. Um, and so this, this one arises because Adams and Reed um, constructed some hyperbolic knots which contain uh, closed uh, quasi-Fuchsian surfaces in their complements. And that, uh, that cannot happen for toroidally alternating knots. Um, and then the other thing that's known about this alternating genus is uh, Hayashi showed that if we have a Montesinos knot, then it's... Um, alternating genus is again at most one. So uh, not very much is known really about this um, alternating genus. Um, uh, so the first question that I have today and which is the one that sort of got me uh, thinking about this for uh, torus knots is in the statement of Adam's theorem where um, he says these uh, prime prime toroidally alternating knots are either torus knots or hyperbolic knots. I was uh, wondering uh, which, exactly which torus knots can occur. And so today we can uh, answer that. And what happens is we get only the P2 torus knots. So these are the um, ones that are alternating in the classical sense. And we also get uh, T43 and T53. Um, and these are the two which are also, uh, these are the non-alternating Montesinos torus knots. Um, so there's an example, there's T43 uh, as a um, F alternating projection on a uh, torus. Uh, the blue thing is the torus and you can see the knots uh, sitting on that surface and occasionally uh, sort of wrapping, wrapping around the back of the handles. They're those uh, sort of dotted parts. Um, so that those crossings that look like the strands crossing the dotted part, they don't actually count as crossings because part of the knots on the front and parts are around the back. Okay. Yeah, all of these look like they have a the two four branch cover as a finite fundamental group. Is that somehow relevant? Uh... Uh, I think this is. I think this is just because they're Montesinos knots. Okay. Yeah, I think we, once we look at the other torus knots, uh, this isn't going to hold, and they're going to the alternating genus is going to be uh, greater than one. Yeah, I'm, I'm not really sure if there's any uh, connection to the uh, double branch covers. All right. Yeah. Okay. So that's uh, that's sort of what got me started thinking about these and. Um, that's good, we can uh, answer that. Uh, then there's another question, which uh, based on what I've told you so far is basically all that's known about this alternating genus. And so uh, Adam Lawrence uh, 
wrote this paper on alternating distances and um, well maybe actually his question was can the alternating genus be arbitrarily large um, and you would certainly expect so knots can be very complicated but um, showing that has um, I guess no one has been able to show that so far um, so I write this question are there any knots where the alternating genus is at least three um, I won't leave you in suspense. We'll just tell you the, the statement now. Um, so for each positive integer, there does exist even a prime knot such that the um, alternating genus is at least uh, that integer. Um, and so in particular, we can take the torus knots. Uh, these are the torus knots 6m plus 1, uh, comma 3. And so they're going to have the alternating genus will be at least uh, m plus 1. Okay, so I can't tell you exactly what their um, alternating genera are, but um, I can at least tell you that it's going to grow, um, it can grow arbitrarily large. Um, and we can calculate a few more um, exact values. Um, so um, here's a few torus knots. These are the first examples of. Uh, any knots where the alternating genus is at least three and known exactly. So the 10-3 and the 11-3 torus knots. And um, there's a few there also torus knots where the alternating genus is exactly two. And then I can also prove that, um, well, it's not quite true that alternating genus is um, additive under connect sum. That's uh, still an open problem, but, uh, from what we study today, we can show that the um, that the uh, alternating uh, genus of a connect sum of some knot which is uh, toroidally alternating, then um, or I mean of alternating genus one, well then uh, when you take uh, connect sums, the um, the genus will be additive. Okay, so we can realize um, every positive integer as an alternating genus, but not necessarily with a, a prime knot. Uh, yet. Okay, so there are the uh, main sorts of results. Are there any questions so far about what we're studying today, these diagrams on surfaces? Okay, so um, this fits into this framework that uh, Adam Lawrence was looking at, and he came up with this notion of a um, alternating distance. And so it's a real valued knot invariant, which is uh, non-negative. It's um, equal to zero if and only if the knot is alternating, and it's a uh, sub-additive under uh, connect sum. So this is this is for any knot you can um, apply. You get this invariant, and it tells you in some sense how far the knot is from being um, alternating. So there's quite a few examples um, of such alternating distances. Um, I'm just going to tell you a few that are relevant to what we're looking at today. Um, so the first example is what's called the de-alternating number. And that's you take some uh, diagram of a knot on the sphere and you ask yourself, how many um, crossing changes do I need to make uh, to make this diagram alternating? and then you minimize it over um, all diagrams of that knot. Okay, this has been uh, studied a little bit. Um, another uh, alternating distance is what's called the uh, derived genus. Um, so what you do here is you take a, um, a diagram on the sphere and you uh, smooth out all the crossings. Uh, so, and you do it in two particular ways. So there's this uh, picture at the bottom. You could do the A smoothing, or you can do the B smoothing. So the derived genus, you do um, all the A you do A smoothings everywhere. You get a collection of circles. Then you do uh, B smoothings everywhere. You get a different collection of circles, and then you um, you can join these collections up by a um, cobordism, which um, just has a little saddle where each uh, crossing was, and then the genus of this cobordism is the um, derived genus. 
Um, and so then you can go ahead and you can cap off all those discs with uh, all those circles with discs. Your knot ends up being um, alternating on the surface at the uh, sort of at the mid level, and um, you have what you've constructed is actually an F alternating diagram of a particular type. And so if you look at all diagrams of the knot and minimize this uh, value, so there's an explicit formula given there in terms of how many circles you get and the crossing number of the diagram you start with. Um, so this is another um, knot invariant. I'm not gonna say too much about this one today because uh, we sort of only really use it. Um, it's been quite, well, quite studied and um, it's sort of gonna be useful for giving us some upper bounds sometimes, but not the lower bounds that we're looking for. Uh, the third example is this alternating genus that I've uh, told you. Um, uh, and the fourth example is uh, something new that we're going to introduce. Um, so somehow this uh, definition of being F alternating where we require all the uh, complementary regions to be disks, uh, I think is a little bit artificial. And it's sort of one of the reasons the alternating genus is so difficult to calculate. So we make this uh, slightly different definition. Again, we take a Heegard surface F. We uh, project the knot onto that surface in an alternating way. But now we just require that the complementary regions are um, checkerboard colorable. So admit a, um, a two coloring and then we get uh, some uh, nice checkerboard surfaces, okay? But now the regions are not necessarily uh, disks. Um, so just to check that I understand that, it sort of still rules out things like if you draw just your torus knot on a torus in the standard way, that's not valid because you just get a single complementary region and so you can Yeah, that's right, yeah, okay. so that one doesn't, um, well, I guess technically that one region is one colorable, is two colorable, but um, yeah, that's not allowed to, um, okay. yeah, that's not, we don't accept that. <laughs> okay. okay. Yeah, maybe instead of checkboard colorable, I wanna say uh, every essential loop on the surface meets the diagram an even number of times or, or something like that. Okay, thanks. Yeah. So, um, well, here's an example. You can see this. This is uh, T43 again. This is a different diagram on the torus. Uh, but now if you look, uh, there's sort of this uh, white region in here. And you can see it uh, then wraps around the back. And so that white region is, a, um, is homeomorphic to an annulus. Okay. So this is a checkerboard Heegard alternating diagram, but it's not a um, F alternating diagram. Um, and again, we can define a alternating distance. It's called the checkerboard Heegard genus, all right, G check uh, H. And it's the minimal such genus of all projection surfaces so that your knot has um, such a diagram. Um, and then we can compare uh, all, these, um, all these alternating distances. Um, so, they all compare nicely. We have the dealternating number is always bigger than the tribe genus, or at most, no, at least the tribe genus, which is at least the alternating genus, which is at least this checkerboard Heegard genus, and is at least something, which I haven't told you what it is yet, this um, defect, DFK. Um, but basically this is gonna be our strategy for studying the alternating genus. Uh, we're going to get upper bounds maybe coming from the Thrive genus, and we're going to get lower bounds coming from this uh, DFK. So really, um, this one here is what we um, is what we're going to study today. Okay, and that's going to be it's going to instead of being a minimum, well, it's still a minimum, but it's it's going to be much more uh, geometric. It's going to be based on surfaces uh, in the knot complement. Um, and let me just say, there has been quite a lot of work on the uh, Thrive genus, and there's some really nice lower bounds for it coming from uh, Higa Fleur homology, Kavana homology, and the um, Colour Jones polynomial. Um, a lot of work of um, Adam Lawrence, but also some other people, and um, they give nice lower bounds for the Thrive genus, 
that they are not um, are not lower bounds for the alternating genus in general. So um, we're sort of we're still at the stage where this alternating genus is not uh, not well understood. Okay, so let me try and work towards telling you what this uh, defect is. Um, so I'll just do a bit of uh, background. A spanning surface for a knot is a connected um, embedded surface sigma such that the boundary of this surface sigma uh, is the knot K. Okay, so we don't insist that this, we definitely don't insist that the surface is orientable. In fact, usually it will be, um, it will be a one-sided surface. Um, and then we often want to look at the knot exterior. That's where we just remove a small uh, open neighborhood of the knot from S3. This is a nice compact orientable three manifold and its boundary is a, a single torus. And then we, can, we want to measure uh, slopes of our surfaces. So we're going to um, define the slope of this spanning surface to be the slope of um, the surface as it intersects the, uh, this boundary torus. And if we write that um, intersection, think of that uh, as a homology class in the uh, first integral homology of that torus, well, we can write it in terms of the um, canonical uh, meridian and longitude. It's just going to be some uh, integral linear combination of those. And then the slope of the surface is uh, the number A over B. So um, a priori, that could be any rational number or um, indeed uh, infinity, such as like one over zero. Um, but since we're only looking at spanning surfaces today, uh, well, that means since we, the boundary of the surface is the knot, we're just wrapping once around uh, the longitude. So we get B is one. And furthermore, the slope is actually always going to be an even integer, okay, for um, homological reasons. So the uh, first homology of the knot exterior is generated by the meridian. And so if we want a curve to bound a surface, a non orientable surface, then we need that homology class to be zero in um, Z mod 2Z uh, homology. Okay, so we get um, the slopes, the slope of these spanning surfaces will always be an even integer. And we're also going to be interested in the Euler characteristics of these surfaces. Um, but more often, I will talk about their uh, first Betty numbers. So for a spanning surface, that's just one minus uh, the Euler characteristic. Um, uh, here's an example. Here's the figure eight knot. Um, I'm sure many of you have seen this before, but um, we can uh, checkerboard color the regions. Uh, so if we look at this gray surface, there's uh, three disks here, but at the crossings, they're joined by uh, half twisted bands. And so what we've constructed here is a once punctured Klein bottle. Uh, so the first Betty number is two and uh, the slope of the surface is uh, negative four. Okay, in terms of this uh, canonical uh, framing. So now we're gonna define a, um, a complex from uh, spanning surfaces. And so what we do, we're going to start with two spanning surfaces that have different slopes. And um, we're going to isotope those uh, two surfaces so that they're in general position. All the uh, intersections will be uh, transverse as possible. Um, and um, they'll be in minimal position with respect to the boundary torus. So that means that um, that the um, uh, they, they're going to the boundary curves on this uh, torus uh, del x. They are going to um, is going to form a quadrangulation of the uh, boundary. So we're not going to see any uh, bygones between those two boundary curves. We can always isotope those away, and what we'll see is this uh, quadrangulation of the boundary torus. So here's a simple example. Suppose we've got these two uh, spanning surfaces. One is uh, red and one is green. The green one maybe has slope negative two and the red one here, it looks like has slope four. And um, 
they fit together to quadrangulate this um, boundary torus. So uh, this is this um, object we want to study, this uh, complex C. Um, it could, there could also be many other uh, self-intersections of the interiors of the surfaces, but uh, near the knot itself, this is uh, what we want it to look like. Um, and so in particular on this uh, complex, it has a one skeleton, it, um, which consists of various parts. So there's um, closed loops of intersection between the interiors of the surfaces. Uh, we can also have arcs of intersection. These are going to correspond uh, basically to uh, the crossing arcs, well, eventually. And there's also going to be a loop coming from the knot K. So if we put the arcs and the loop together, this is going to form some uh, connected trivalent graph. And um, so the one skeleton will look like this trivalent graph plus some uh, arbitrary collection of uh, closed loops. And then uh, I guess the two dimensional parts, uh, the thing to notice is they're not necessarily cells. So they're not necessarily uh, homeomorphic to uh, disks. And in fact, if we do have um, closed loops of intersection, then there will be some faces which are, are not disks. Okay. So this uh, complex has a Euler characteristic. It's going to be the sum of the Euler characteristics of the um, uh, of the two spanning surfaces, um, but we've uh, double counted a little bit. We've uh, double counted the um, arcs of intersection between their interiors, and it turns out that the number of arcs is going to be half the number of uh, intersection points on that boundary torus. So this I here, this is the geometric intersection number of uh, the two, those red and green curves on that boundary torus. Okay. So then we make a uh, definition. So this, um, this has actually appeared in a paper of Ito, and he gave it the name, the spanning surface defect. Um, and so um, we can define it as the minimum over all uh, such complexes. Uh, as one minus half the Euler characteristic of that complex. So given any two spanning surfaces for a, a knot, we can, um, we can uh, form a complex, and then we want to look at the minimum uh, such, such value. Um, and we can rewrite that in terms of the first Betty numbers and the slopes of the surfaces. So it's just half the minimum over all uh, pairs of spanning surfaces of the sums of their first Betty numbers minus half uh, the absolute value of the difference of their, uh, of their slopes. Okay. And it turns out this is indeed an alternating distance. So it's going to give us a way of uh, measuring how far we are from being alternating. Uh, the proof comes from uh, so previous work of myself and independently uh, Josh Green is we gave a, um, a non-diagrammatic characterization of alternating knots. Um, and basically, if we reword that, it's saying that this defect is always uh, non-negative, and it's going to be equal to zero if and only if the knot is um, alternating on S2. Um, and furthermore, I can prove that this, um, this invariant is, um, is actually additive under connect sum. So none of these other alternating distances are known to be um, additive, but uh, this, one, this one is. Okay, so that's, um, that's the invariant. And then just to remind you that indeed uh, we do have this, uh, we can compare these alternating distances that we've defined today. Uh, the first inequality follows just because um, an F alternating diagram, that's the one where all the complementary regions are disks. That's uh, always checkerboard colorable. So it's always a uh, checkerboard Hegard alternating diagram. And then to uh, prove that this, the second inequality, uh, so what we do is we take this complex, uh, we look at the arcs of intersection between the interiors of the two surfaces, 
and we just collapse those two points. And so what we get is um, we get some surface S. This is now going to be an immersed surface in S3. So there could still be these uh, loops of double points of self-intersection, uh, but the Euler characteristics are going to be the same. Um, but the thing to notice here is that the surface S is not necessarily embedded, it's not necessarily orientable, and it's not necessarily a Heyard surface. So it's going to be, um, it's going to give a lower bound on the um, alternating genus. And just an, a quick example to kind of maybe think um, about what this like complex might look like. If we take this little graph here, one vertex and two edges, and think of it sitting in the complex plane, and then we cross that with an interval, and then we uh, glue the two ends together with a um, rotation by pi, then this is one way of forming an immersed Klein bottle in S3. It's maybe not the first immersion everyone goes to, but it is, um, it is a nice immersion of a Klein bottle. Um, and then if we project some knot onto that uh, Klein bottle, then uh, the cross section might look like something like this. Um, so if we take a cross section that doesn't pass through any crossings, we're going to see uh, some intersections with the knot, are those black dots, and we're going to see the two checkerboard surfaces. Uh, one's red, one's green here, and um, you'll see that they self-intersect in the center as we um, follow that round. So there's a whole circle worth of uh, intersection points there. You're going to see that there's um, those two checkerboard surfaces uh, intersect, and there's no way of um, getting rid of that uh, intersection. So um, this would be something where the uh, defect is um, is one, but the um, we don't know what the checkerboard Heegar genus is because this is not giving a, um, a, a like a f alternating diagram. Okay, does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, so there's this problem for uh, spanning surfaces. We'll call it the geography problem. And sorry, sorry. That, uh, that didn't make sense to me. Could you just explain the step step two again? So you're starting with this complex, and you're yeah. collapsing some things to produce something which is not embedded, or potentially not embedded, orientable, or Hagard. So how does that give you a? Sorry, oh, so, that, that, so that's going to give you this uh, defect. So yeah. this defect is defined in terms of this uh, Euler characteristic of C yeah. or of S. Yep. And it's just saying this is a lower bound for the, um, this uh, checkerboard Hegar genus. Because the checkerboard Hegar genus gives us a complex. It's just the, oh, okay. the, yeah. Yeah, it's easy. the diagram on yeah, the surface easy. and you collapse the crossing arcs to points. Oh, okay, thanks. Yeah. Um, so this geography problem, and maybe this is the real question today. This is what we're really interested in. Given any knot in the three sphere, um, find all pairs of uh, slope and first Betty number, which can be realized by a spanning surface. Okay, so this is what I'm, uh, I guess, really interested in. Um, to, in order to do this, so there's going to be infinitely many uh, such pairs, but um, we can, what we, all we really actually need to do is to study the uh, geometrically essential ones. So these are the, surface that, the surfaces that are geometrically incompressible and geometrically boundary incompressible. Um, and I really do mean geometrically um, because these are one-sided surfaces. There is a difference between um, being algebraically incompressible and being uh, geometrically incompressible. Um, and the reason we can get away with that is because there's this move called uh, stabilization if we have a little uh, local picture of our checkerboard surfaces and we put a little, uh, a little twist into the knot, um, this is just an isotopy on the white surface, but on the uh, gray surface, we have changed the slope by plus or minus two, depending which way we uh, put the twist in, and we've increased the uh, first Betty number by one. So once we have a geometrically essential surface, we can find um, 
a whole heap, we can find the sort of a whole cone over that surface of um, other spanning surfaces. Um, and there's one more result we can prove from this uh, complex. If we have a spanning surface, then this, this uh, parity result, the first Betty number has the same parity as uh, half the slope. Okay, so what we can do then is we can, uh, there's the space of spanning surfaces for a knot. We can uh, plot all these points in the plane. So we plot slope on one axis, the first Betty number on the other, the blue dots at the bottom. Um, although to be fair, there could also be some blue dots sort of scattered around anywhere. These are the geometrically essential surfaces. And then we can, um, uh, we can get these other ones from our stabilization. So sort of um, stabilizations you can like move in these like diagonals like this. Um, so anyway, this is what we're trying to understand. And this is related to the defect because the defect is always going to be realized by some complex, which comes from picking uh, one surface on this um, extreme ray on the left and picking one surface from the extreme ray uh, on the right. So if you're out here and you do one of these stabilizations staying in this extremal ray, that's not going to um, change the, um, the defect. But you're going to get a, a different uh, complex. Okay, so we can, uh, we're going to get, be able to understand this invariant if we can understand um, uh, some special types of spanning surfaces. Okay, so before I start talking about torus knots, I just have to make one more uh, little digression. Uh, there's a function. So we take two positive integers, one of them's odd, and as I'm going to call it the bread and wood function. So it takes in these uh, 2k and q, and it uh, gives out a, um, a positive integer. It's defined recursively by uh, the following rules. Uh, they don't really matter. It can also be calculated more easily in practice from a uh, continued fraction expansion for 2k over q. Um, but the reason it's interesting is because Breton and Wood proved uh, the following theorem um, a long time ago now. Uh, they said um, if you take a non a closed non orientable surface uh, in the lens space L2kq, then the minimal possible B1 is uh, given by this function, N of uh, 2kq. Um, so we're going to want to uh, use this function today. But in fact, we're going we're to want it to apply in uh, further circumstances. So we need to, um, we want this also to work where the first argument is uh, odd. So we take two co-prime uh, positive integers. We define uh, n hat of pq uh, by the following rules. Um, if p is even, we, it's the original function. If q is even, it's the original function with q as the first argument. And if pq is odd, well then we define it recursively. We write it as a um, sum of two functions with n hat. Um, and this recursive definition will actually end after two steps. So in the second step, um, either P1 or Q1 will be even, and either P2 or Q2 will be even. Um, so where these numbers come from is we write our, um, our fraction P over Q, where P and Q are both odd, as a um, Fary sum. So this is a very uh, simple way of adding fractions. And I like to joke it's so simple, even uh, first year calculus students can do it. And so the way of adding fractions this way is you just add the numerators together to get the numerator and you add the denominators together to get the denominator. Okay. Um, so if we have, uh, and also we have this um, extra criterion that um, the absolute value of P1 Q2 minus P2 Q1 is um, one. So this comes from the, um, there's this uh, Fary triangulation of the, um, uh, of the um, hyperbolic disk. And if, um, 
P1 over Q1 and P2 over Q2 are um, two vertices of some triangle, then uh, the third uh, vertex is going to be labelled by uh, P over Q. Sorry, I should have drawn a picture of the, um, the fairy triangulation. But um, anyway, here's an example. Say we have the fraction 11 over 7. We can write that as 8 over 5 plus uh, 3 over 2. Um, and then from that, we can go back, plug it all into the rules. I left out all the details. But for example, n hat of 11, 7 is uh, 3. OK. So um, now we're going to try and apply all this theory uh, to torus knots. Um, they seem to be the sort of simplest knots that give us um, non-trivial results for this uh, defect. So I'll just remind you what a torus knot is, um, in case um, you haven't seen it before. But we take some Hegard torus in S3 that splits. <coughs> Sorry, excuse me. That um, splits the three sphere into two solid tori, B and W. Then uh, there's some curves on this torus. So alpha bounds a disk in V, uh, beta bounds a disk in W. And then if we have some embedded curve on this torus, um, it can be written as, it can be thought of as a homology class and written as a linear combination of these uh, alpha and beta. Um, the coefficients are P and Q, and they're going to be the P and Q in the definition of this uh, torus knot. So here's an example. Here's the torus knot T53. Um, you can also have negative P's and Q's, but as far as we're concerned today, there's enough uh, symmetry going on that uh, if we just answer this for positive torus knots, then um, the results carry over to the various other, um, like the P negative Q will be this, the results for P negative Q will be the same as for PQ. Um, and then there's some special uh, spanning surfaces that come along with a torus knot. One is the Seifert surface, um, or the minimal genus Seifert surface. Uh, it satisfies the following results. Its first Betty number is given by this formula, P minus one times Q minus one. Uh, and its slope is uh, zero because Seifert surfaces are um, always orientable. Um, the second surface uh, we're interested in, I'm going to call the Terragaito surface. Uh, this is the surface which uh, realizes the cross cap number of the torus knot. So that's the minimal B1 of a non orientable uh, spanning surface for the knot. So Terry Guido wrote this nice paper which uh, very much influenced what we're doing today, um, where uh, he didn't quite give the formulas in the way I'm giving them here, but um, the formula for the cross cap number of the torus knot, which is the uh, B1 of the Terry Guido surface, is this function uh, n hat. Uh, of P and Q. And the slope of the surface is uh, PQ plus epsilon. Epsilon is negative one, zero, or one, uh, depending on, well, it just has to satisfy this uh, uh, congruence. Um, but um, geometrically, this uh, it like means uh, it's sort of like different types of uh, torus knots. Um, but we don't need to go into that. We've got a nice uh, formula. And then uh, the theorem. So Terry Guido didn't quite prove this because he was only interested in the cross cap number, but um, I'm sure he could have if he wanted to. And so it's just a small extension uh, on my part. If we have a geometrically essential spanning surface for a torus knot, then either it is the minimal genus Seifert surface or it is the Terry Guido surface. These are the only uh, things that show up. And I should just mention that the Terry Guido surface is interesting because it's, um, well, as long as Q's uh, at least three, I mean, as long as it's not, yeah, as long as we're not looking at an alternating torus knot, if we're looking at a non alternating one, then uh, the Terry Guido surface is geometrically essential, but it's not um, algebraically essential. So the fundamental group of the surface does not inject into the. Uh, fundamental group of the, uh, into the knot group. Okay, so then we uh, have a theorem. We can calculate 
the defect of a torus knot uh, ex exactly. It's the following not very nice formula. It's the minimum of uh, two quantities. I don't think I can even bring myself to read them out, but you can see them on the screen. Um, and there's also this little uh, uh, value delta. It could be one, two, or three, depending on uh, some uh, congruence. Okay, but just given the information P or Q, P and Q, you can calculate this uh, defect for a torus knot. So what does this look like in our space of uh, spanning surfaces? Well, there's, uh, there's two pictures. Well, a priori, there's actually three pictures. So the one on the right here, we've got the, um, the pterygoido surface at the bottom and the cyphert surface somewhere in the middle. And we see that the cone on the cyphert surface is contained inside the cone on the um, pterygoido surface. So that can happen. Um, this is a cartoon picture. Usually the pterygoido surface would be like way across to the right, but um, nevertheless, one cone's contained inside the other one. This gives the um, second line in the formula. So this just gives a defect of n hat. Uh, possibly you might think the pterygoido cone could be contained inside the cipher cone. That actually uh, never happens. So that doesn't appear in our formula. And then the third case is when the cipher cone and the pterygoido cone, uh, neither is contained in the other. That's this uh, picture on the left. Um, that's gonna give us the uh, top line. So that uh, more complicated uh, formula for the defect. Okay, uh, so that formula was a bit of a mess, but um, that's sort of where it's coming from by building the complexes from uh, the different situations that can occur from the um, geography problems. Uh, but we can do a bit of analysis on, uh, on this function. And if we set P to be bigger than Q and at least two, then we can write down this defect. It's um, zero only when uh, Q equals two. It's one when Q is three and P is either four or five. And otherwise we're in this um, second case where the cipher cone is contained inside the pterygoido cone. Um, and that's when we get defect is uh, in hat. So at this point, um, this is when we can uh, answer our original question, which was when are toroidally alternating knots, which torus knots are toroidally alternating? And you can see straight away here, um, well, since in the otherwise case, n hat is always at least two, um, these, this is gonna tell us exactly which uh, torus knots are toroidally alternating. Um, and so that uh, answers that question. Um, to answer our other question, which was, um, can the alternating genus be arbitrarily large? Uh, well, you can write down a lot of bounds on this um, alternating genus. Here's a few. So here's the first four lines here describe what's happening for the um, P3 torus knots. Um, there's a few different cases, but um, we can see it's, um, it's bounded by linear functions of M. Um, and so we see that the alternating genus can be arbitrarily large. The lower bounds here are coming from the defect. The upper bounds are coming from uh, uh, the Tarayev genus, the constructions of um, Abe and Kishimoto and also uh, Lawrence. Um, so that's what's happening for the odd torus knot. In general, for any odd torus knot, um, that's basically what's going to happen. We're going to get linear bounds uh, depending on the, um, the uh, if the second factor, the Q is smaller. Um, for the even torus knot, something uh, different happens. We get this uh, universal upper bound. And so the alternating genus of the um, P4 torus knots, it's um, always at least two and it's always um, at most four. Um, and you can write down similar bounds for, um, for I mean, any torus knot, um, but uh, apart from the ones I mentioned at the start, I think there were five prime torus knots I could calculate this uh, alternating genus explicitly. Um, none of the others um, I could get uh, an exact uh, value. Um, and that's one of the reasons I think this, um, this alternating genus is a little bit artificial 
this restriction that you want all the um, all the complementary regions to be disks. Um, topologically, from a three manifold perspective, that doesn't really mean anything, but it's just sort of a a carryover of people who have been studying these knots from a more uh, diagrammatic perspective, I guess. Um, but I also mentioned there was this uh, checkerboard Higa genus. Uh, in this case, we have a lot more success calculating this um, invariant. So here's our three infinite families of um, torus knots. We can calculate their um, checkerboard Higa genus um, uh, exactly. So I won't go uh, through those, but um, we get we, we can obtain a lot more uh, information. Okay, so that's um, that's all I have for you today. Thank you. Okay, uh, thanks, Josh. Uh, Thank are there you. any questions? Okay. Well, I had one at least. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned, I mean, you come at this sort of, well, you mentioned a, a theorem earlier, which you attributed to you and uh, Josh Green. Um, mm -hmm. and, and you're sort of clearly proving it by the way you think about things, uh, as opposed to the way he thinks about things, which is putting these forms on surfaces. Did, did, did that theorem, I mean, did that theorem actually also come from his work or were you just being a little bit polite? Uh. Well, in the case where, um, well, I mean, in the case, it's, I think it's more than just being polite. I think okay. in that case, like, you know, the fact that it's alternating if and only if, um, you know, that defect is zero is like that explicit statement is in his paper as well. I mean, the proof is different. You're right. I'm thinking yeah. about it from my perspective, but um, no, he, uh, he also proved that. Okay. So is that, so maybe I've forgotten what the statement was then. Um, yeah. uh, oh, I don't know. It's a long way back, but um, okay. yeah. But in his perspective, that I don't think that really carries over here because if you um, sort of loosen the restriction a little bit and say, you know, in his one, you've got these uh, bilinear forms and you want uh, there to be a positive definite one and a negative definite one. Yeah. If you then look at a diagram on a torus. Uh, generally one of those um, two checkerboard surfaces now is no longer going to be definite. But it's, um, it's, not clear, it's not clear to me what you get. If you say like one surface is definite and one is almost definite, like I'm not sure that's necessarily going to give this uh, complex type of thing. Okay. I mean, you're sort of answering now the question I meant to ask, I think, was can you do it by forms and, and things? rather than complexes and slopes, but okay. Um, are there any, any, other, any other questions? More a request, are, are your lecture notes to be made av available to us? Um, sure, I can do that. Yeah. And the video yeah. will also make an appearance on, on YouTube. <laughs> Although so far the, the uptake in viewing them has been has been limited, so um. yeah, that's good. I never need to um, give another talk again. I can yeah, just um, send thing? out a YouTube link. One yeah. of the side effects <laughs> of the pandemic might be that mathematicians have all run out of talks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but like you say, no one's watching them on YouTube. So yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, if there are uh, no more questions, then let's. Uh, Thank Josh again. Great, thanks for having me.